Got it. All right, I am currently live. Hello, everyone. This is our first time doing this. At least, at least it's my first time. Yeah, and I'm I'm on camera. There I go. I can see myself a little bit. Cool. We're gonna play the demo for I Expect You Die Two: The Spy and the Liar. And I'm gonna answer all of your questions, or I'm gonna try give you a little bit of that developer perspective. Yeah. And you can't hear Cat, I don't think, but I can hear her. And and she's gonna field me your questions since I can't see them. I don't yet have sweet fancy Steam overlay stuff to see chat. I uh, hope to have that one day. But until then, uh, she's gonna be watching the chat and fielding your questions, sending them to me in my earpiece like the handler, and I will answer them to the best of my ability. I'll probably play through the demo a few times and yeah, talk about what it all went into making it over this crazy past year and a half. All right, <laughs> they're watching me. Probably a little bit of a delay, but welcome folks on YouTube. Uh, we are just getting started. I think we'll uh, start officially at six, but um, we're testing this out to see if it's working. We're doing some fancy stuff to try to stream it to YouTube and on Steam at the same time and also have it on Discord so I can talk to Kat and she can relay me messages and questions and such and tell me when the stream has gone down and I'm speaking to no one, <laughs> which hopefully doesn't happen. Well, for those of you listening, I hope you can also hear the music in this title screen room, which was, oh no, all right. Maybe it's muted and I need to, Unmute it. Yeah, I see 11 folks, 12, 12, 13. Oh, it's going up. Yeah, I'm not seeing like a mute or anything on my video. It might be okay. Might be okay. I know the, um, the Discord stream is unlikely to have audio. Okay, we still got a few minutes. Okay. Yeah, let me know if you see anything on your side for audio on Restream. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, the team put a lot of love and effort into that. We wanted to create as good, if not better, of an experience than the first one. And we worked real hard to make it special and different, but still have a lot of the same qualities of the first one. So we think you're really gonna like it. It does have some, I mean, you've seen, of course, in the flat version, but in the immersive VR version, even still, it has a different feel to it. Okay, I'm not seeing anything on my settings for um, audio from the game. It's also pretty quiet, so maybe you just can't hear it because it's quiet. Um, let's do a little test, and I'll um, I'll play some, see if you can hear. Your uh, okay? Can you see okay? Bloop. Also, try to turn it up on my end. Okay, can you hear the game? Okay. 
I'm trying. Huda. How about? Ooh, yeah. Dropping some frames. Okay. I'm going to quit out and reset. Ooh, that was a mistake. Yeah, it looks like it stopped sharing it entirely. Well, <laughs> it does look like Steam has crashed for me. So I'll see if I can get it back up and running. Oh, I not even do restream. Well, even still, I, I need Steam to run the game. Often critical to sharing, sharing the game content. Um, but it looks like it's starting back up, so I should be up and running, maybe with a slight delay, but not too, too bad. Okay, looks like the game is back up and running, sweet. And now I just need to get it uh, streaming. Trivial. All right. Can you see my game again on Restream? Yeah. Oh, sweet. Uh, there is none coming from the game yet, so maybe some will come in later. And if not, you know what? I'll talk so much, you won't even need the audio. It'll be a very weird intro trailer experience. <laughs> yeah, I'll just, I know all the lyrics, I'll sing over it. Uh, do you hear any music in here? Shocking. All right. Uh, are we close to six? All right, we've begun. Welcome, everyone who's watching the stream, either on YouTube or maybe Steam. I think we've maybe got it on Steam, maybe some other places that I don't even know about. I am Charlie Amos. I am the project director for I Expect You to Die 2, The Spy and the Liar. And I'm so excited to share this demo with you all. Um, we'll be looking at the chat for any questions you all have about the development of the game that I am more than happy to answer. Hopefully give you all sorts of behind the scenes info, tell you about the process behind making the game, um, everything that went into it, stuff that didn't go into it that maybe will go into future games, um, any and all things spend a little time with you all, and hopefully we'll just have a good time and play a cool game. Got it. All right, cool. I apologize for the lack of in-game audio. I don't think I'm going to be able to figure it out, unfortunately. Uh, but that way you'll, you'll get to hear me more, and we'll get to, uh, to chat together more. All right, I'm going to start this demo. Um, as you've probably already seen, the demo uh, includes a tutorial experience, um, a little bit of our office hub. If you remember the first game, there was an office where you could go on missions from that, and just a little bit of the first mission, just a tease of it. So I'll play through that and talk about some of what went into it. I'll probably replay it a couple of times, uh, but really I'm excited to hear what you all are interested about, what kind of questions you have. Um, we can have some back and forth. Uh, is there anything already, Kat, that I should respond to before I get started? 
Oh boy. All right, I'm ready. I'm ready. Cool. So I can say that, right? I got to repeat everything I'm hearing you say, Kat. Yeah. All right, cool. Cool. So for everyone listening, I've got Kat in my ear. You can't hear her, but I'm going to repeat stuff she's uh, telling me. So yes, the game is coming out in August. That is really soon. We don't have an exact date for you yet, but you really don't have to wait too long. Yes, the original is on the Quest. Uh, honestly, it's my favorite version of the game. I just like the freedom of wireless. Um, and I also think that our porting team just did a fabulous job on making the game look really good, despite you know the lower specs on that headset. I am going to try a little bit. Am I? That seems like a really bad idea. Maybe. <laughs> It could, you know, if I had if I had a little background, a little bit of beatboxing to it, I could maybe pull it off. But I think I think instead, we'll record that for an Easter egg. We'll put it on Discord later. <laughs> uh, I will say though, um, the oh, I've got a fun anecdote about the first uh, about the intro song. Did you have something for me, Cat? Here's my anecdote. Um, the one of the, the people who was just instrumental in writing the song and getting the, the song started is Jared Mason. Uh, shockingly, he is also the voice of the handler, multi-talented dude. Um, he was just inspired by some of the original concept for this game when, when we were putting it together. And he came up with this concept for some lyrics based on the themes we had talked about, about facade and pretending you're someone that you're not. And, um, he just came into the office one day and he came right up to my desk and he just straight acapella sang the entire song to me. Blew, blew me away. He's a great singer too. Um, he iterated on a little bit and then later we had um, Scrum with the team, right? We're just in a, a meeting room. We've got all of our tasks up on the board. Jared busts into the room and starts singing the song to the whole team. First time they've ever heard it. And uh, memory for a lifetime. And honestly, the the track that we're shipping is darn close to what he originally envisioned. All right, I'm gonna start this demo. <sighs> you know what? There won't be this time. I hate to say it. I'm gonna have to be your developer bubble. <laughs> and hopefully I can be even better than bubbles. What we found is just analytics wise, not a lot of people uh, got to those bubbles or used those bubbles. Um, but we are still excited to talk about the development of the game. But there won't be the commentary bubble time this time. Yes, more story stuff. Um, yeah, I can tell you that one of the big goals for this uh, the sequel uh, since we wanted it to stay true to a lot of the mechanics that made the first one so successful, we were thinking, how are we going to iterate on this? How are we going to make this special? And something that we saw um, players were really into is uh, some of the lore, right? And they want to know more about this world, more about the characters. Um, you also may know that the first game, we just released it as, as one level, as just the car level, um, Friendly Skies. And then we said, oh, people like it. Let's add a few more levels. We made four. We shipped that as the original title. People liked that. So we made a fifth level. Um, then people liked that. And, and later we, uh, we ported it to the quest. And through that, we um, made levels six and seven, which I was the project director on those last two levels. Uh, the handler keeps telling me to stick the tape in. I'm not ready yet, handler. I'm, I'm talking. Uh, where was I? <laughs> I'm gonna just put it into stop him from talking to me. He's he's talking more now, but here it comes. Awesome. I'm hearing a question from Cat. Yes, I'm so glad you liked the first one. As you all uh, may know, it came out a really long time ago. But what we found is. A lot of what we do in this game, the big affordances, 
the interesting close spaces, the telekinesis that's just pretty darn intuitive, as weird as it is. Uh, it still works. It's still good, even though you know we've seen a lot of innovation in VR. A lot of what we touched on early on still transfers pretty well. So yes, getting back to my story, it was that um, we wanted to go deeper into cohesiveness this time. Last time, it was all hodgepodge, us adding levels as we went. This time, we said, hey, let's plan out every level all together at once, make sure each one connects to the next and builds a singular experience. So for me, that was super important about this one is it's a single experience. Yes, it's got levels, but really, you're going to be along for the ride. It's like Uncharted has chapters, right? But you don't really remember, oh, man, chapter four was awesome. You remember the whole experience as this more linear thing that has, when it ends, you remember the whole thing. That was my goal for this, is that by the end, you really appreciate it as a singular game and not just um, a series of levels. I'm going to disarm this totally real bomb. Bloop. Something you'll find when you play this is we've got nice little haptic events as you move a lot of these interfaces so they feel nice and juicy. Tick, 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 tick. Boop. Yes. Uh, to make them feel human? Interesting. Well, I mean, some things that we did is we found that up close human characters in VR aren't that great. Um, there's just, you get that feeling that they're not real when they get up close. I don't know about you, but as much as I loved Half-Life Alex and so many other games with um, human models that get pretty close, I can't help myself. I throw stuff at them. I throw things at their head. I mess with them. I tickle them with a fork. And uh, they don't react. And like they don't react in Skyrim, right? So it's not the weirdest thing. But in VR, you just have a higher expectation for reaction from affordances. You can do so much more with your head and hands. Uh, so what we found in this, or, or what we thought would be wise, is when we do depict human characters, put them at a bit of a distance, right? Get that character element and that presence without that weirdness of like, how come he's not look, looking me in the eye? How come he's not um, reacting to me tickling him with a fork? Uh, I'll, I will say, though, if you try to tickle anybody in this game with a fork, they will react. Guaranteed. <laughs> or your money back. All right, I'm going to... I am supposed to use my telekinesis to let this grenade. Boy, I want to get through this demo real slow. Here we go. a check -a. Zoop. Later, I'll speed run the tutorial and hopefully impress you all with my tutorial speed run skills. Bloop. Yeah. So that was a question from Kat about how some of the levels felt more like side quests in the first game. And will this game have a more cohesive narrative? Maybe I already answered that, but the, the answer is absolutely yes. That was one of the big goals for this. And I mean, obviously, I am incredibly biased because I think this is a great game. But uh, cohesiveness is definitely something you're going to feel. Um, it might be something that you just <laughs> that you just play all the way through because it really pulls you through. Um, it's it is much less episodic and more of a singular, almost like movie experience. It's cinematic. I'll put it that way. All right, I'm putting this grenade in this bomb disposal device. Zoop. Yeah. Oh, Ugh, missed it. All right, Kat, I'm ready for another question. I know. I've I noticed that and I don't know where folks get that from. If anybody in the chat knows why folks call the handler Sam, let me know. Cause I have no idea why y'all call him Sam. But it's really cool. I think his official name is the handler. I believe that is how he is credited. Sometimes internally, we call him Jared because it's Jared Mason, uh, who is also in the credits, of course. Um, 
But no, he does not have an official name. As you probably noticed, the agency isn't super hip to personal details. Um, I don't think we are the handler's only agent. The way that he talks to us is not the most respectful. And he gives you the impression that he's got like maybe 30 other agents that he deals with. And yeah, we don't know anything about him. He could be anybody. I know there's speculation that maybe he's not the good guy. Maybe he's working for Xeraxis. And there's there's some evidence to support that theory. I'll put it that way. All right, I got to hover a clipboard. I'm going to get back to work here. Oh, a bomb. That's fine. I'll just put that there. Wait, clipboard. Oh, this is a clipboard. Here, I'll hover it upside down. <laughs> I bet the devs didn't think of this. They didn't. It worked. Okay. Cat thought that was funny. I don't know if you're laughing at who, but she's laughing. I'm doing it for Cat. I've heard some people say that they think this was a mistake. It was not. <laughs> that is all I'll say about that. Pew! Yes, uh, the question was, how do we make actions feel grandiose despite being <laughs> a very strange agent who never gets out of their chair? Uh, I will ask you all this. If you had telekinesis, would you ever get out of your chair? Uh, <laughs> uh, it is pretty convenient to just sit and grab everything from your seated position. Um, but yeah, so there is definitely an element to um, an indirect uh, Indirect actions, for instance, I've got this cool little remote detonator. I can do a nice big explosion, not direct, but right. I can open this up, TK this in, close it up, and then get a nice haptic and see the explosion there. So there's a little indirectness, um, but there's a bit of that. I, I think um, minor, minor spoilers, there's some action in level five of the first game, first game. Um, in which you get your hands on a gun and you're being attacked um, from all sorts of interesting directions and you have to use the gun to defend yourself. You have to dodge with your body, right? It's not a big motion, but even still, like it's a motion we're not used to in console games and gives you that 3D space element. And even just feeling it in your body and feeling the stress on your body, I think also gets you in the action. So it doesn't take much. It doesn't require running around your room or or ducking fully. Sometimes it can just be like crouching down in your chair as a laser goes over your head. Uh, in general, what we've found is VR is just such an interaction dense medium because I can get in so close. I can look at every little edge, touch all these objects, touch all these little buttons. Look at this little thing. I can grab the little antenna and move it. Because of that, because this is all so close, you don't need locomotion necessarily. I don't need to walk around this room. Um, there's already so much that I can touch and reach and look at. Uh, so instead of creating these like big uh, Skyrim worlds or even like a Half-Life Alex world, that's not huge, but you walk around in it. We've made really dense spaces where there's a lot to do in a close proximity. Tutorial is not a great example of that, um, but you'll see when I get into the next level, there's just a lot going on in a small space. And that's really I think what makes I Expect You Die pretty darn special. I gotta find more bombs. Let me find this little squeaker. Here's something fun to know. This used to squeak when you grabbed it. We took it out because it was like an edge case, but it still squeaks if you toss it. Oh, you can't hear it. Oh, you can't hear it. It's tragic. All right, I will squeak. I'll squeak for it. Eek. Eek. Squeak it. Uh, it's delightful, and it has at least at least fourteen squeaks. Premium, premium squeaks. It also has a uh, it has a squeak of death when you blow it up. Oh, oh, tragic. Um, to do my impression, squeaker. That's basically how it sounded. All right, I'm ready for another question, cat. Yes. Peter 
<laughs> cool. All right, I'll repeat some of that. Um, so some theories as to why <laughs> he's called Sam. Support agent, S-A, and then you just toss an M on it to make a name, right? Or support agent manager. Well, there you go. Um, also, there's lots of <laughs> lots of sandwiches, and I expect you to die. And so, of course, he'd be named Sam after sandwich. Short, short for sandwich. Sandwich Johnson. Perhaps his name is Eugene Floyd, or Jamie Jamie Meyer. It's these um these plaques. Uh, we did have. We had teammate names on these plaques for a little bit and then found we really couldn't represent all of the team through these spots. So we we ended up um, replacing them with just some generic names, I hate to say. Although <laughs> S. Kang, Sean <laughs> left his name in, who I think I think he was responsible for removing the names. And shock of all shocks, his didn't, <laughs> his didn't get removed. But you know what, Sean, you did such an awesome job on this project. Kudos. You deserve it. <laughs> we'll let it slide this next time. We'll, you won't be so lucky. All right. Ooh. Oh, that's a great question. That was a question about escape rooms with different themes, right? When you go to a real physical escape room joint, they don't just have one themed room. They usually, they might have a James Bond spy type thing, but they might have like a Egyptian tomb or um, the like mansion of some wealthy archeologist or something crazy like that. Uh, so have we thought of doing uh, other games with different themes? I think that's a great suggestion. We haven't, honestly, I don't think I've heard much of that in the studio. Um, but I could see us bringing a lot of the same elements. If you just change up the theme, so many of our devices and interactions are spy themes, and we're constantly thinking about the spy fantasy. So if we just change that theme, that would be um, a very different experience. That's exciting. I like that idea. I'm creating uh, my own weird little person here, made out of objects. <laughs> that is not his normal voice. It is, as John Lovitz would say, acting. There's a, a dated SNL reference for you. No, it is one of his many voices. I'm talking a lot about Jared. I hope you don't, he doesn't mind. He is a fantastic DM for Dungeons and Dragons too. And through that, he does a tremendous number of voices. Um, he's also a great singer. So he just has a, a really big vocal range. And this is uh, his nondescript, sort of British, but not British, but fancy voice that works perfectly. Of course, uh, the question was, will there be multiple solutions to puzzles? Definitely. Um, that is not only fun, uh, but we think it's important when we play test, which we do quite a bit, uh, we find people try to solve our challenges in a variety of different ways. And when they try something that they think was clever, and we think we could probably support, we try to make it just work, right? Let's say you have a toothbrush and you try to stick it in your mouth. I know this is not an alternate solution to a puzzle, but right, like this, this should sock it into your mouth. And so we make it do that. But let's say you try to use this in some kind of puzzle, like it fits into a certain spot where maybe this fit in, but this doesn't, <clears throat> we'll make sure to support that too. But sometimes alternate solutions are really elaborate. And when that happens, we tend to tie them to souvenirs. As you may remember, there was a souvenir system in the first game in which if you did special actions or found special stuff, you'd get little rewards in your office space. We have that again in this game um, and I have even more so exaggerated the um, the fact that you need to do something special. You need to solve something in a way that wasn't how, maybe the most obvious way. So it'll really almost be like an additional puzzle layer of 
oh, man, how, how am I going to solve this with a little bit of word hint uh, in order to, to progress and then get a cool little souvenir in your office? All right, here's my, my person made out of boards and such. I'm very proud. I'm very proud of them. Isn't, isn't, aren't they glorious? It's really the hat. I, I think as a fascinator, just on the side, you know, <laughs> subtle. There we go. Okay. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to start progressing again. Oh, I just have to blow this up. All right. Uh, I'm going to do this and it's going to progress the tutorial and we're going to head on into the uh, strangely quiet intro credit sequence. Here we go. Sing along if you know it at home. I'm cleared for field work. Oh, God. Ah, malfunction. Wait, this is unexpected. No. Ah. The handler's telling me not to worry, but it's not working. Agreed. Now I can hear the song, which is very distracting. I am going to sadly mute it. All right, instead of singing along. Oof. Okay, I've muted it. Um, have they seen any I Expect You to Die memes? Uh, I haven't, honestly, not that many. There's John Juniper. I mean, there's figure on stage who's definitely John Juniper. I'm sure you've all figured that out. Uh, here's all the lovely people who worked on the game, Chase, Ryan, Marlena, were our level leads. How can I not call out all the names? It's gonna be so hard not to. Oh yeah, I'll look in some weird places that maybe, maybe y'all haven't looked. Always look behind you. There's interesting stuff all around, all around. Not as much in this one. I like this part a lot with the stars that rise up, turn into saw blades, come at you, you can try to dodge them. I'm very proud of this scene. This is <laughs> something I was really hoping we could pull off with the um, homage to the classic James Bond moment and this and like the pose with him shooting. Oh, man, there's so much, so much in here that I want to talk about. I'll have to play through a few times. Um, any other questions I should hit, Kat? Are you still there? Uh-oh. Have I lost my handler? Oh, I have, because I turned my sound off. <laughs> that was dumb. I think I muted you, Kat. Can I, you hear, can I hear you now? Uh-oh. Oh, I think I hear you. Yes. I hear you. I was foolish when I muted the game and that muted you. All right. Yes, I'm ready for the next question. Whew. Ooh, fascinating. I, it does, doesn't it? Well, unfortunately in the demo, yes, sorry, I gotta repeat the question. Um, the question was, why does it look like the, um, the Enhanced Aperture's Division logo is covering something up in the tutorial room? Um, I think it's likely just sloppy agency design that they just are slapping things over. It's probably like some bad wallpaper job that they're trying to cover up. That's my assumption. Oh yeah, this is the van, everybody. If you haven't seen it from other streams. And by the van, I mean your new office. It is smaller than the last office. Um, but again, with interaction density. Yes, mini fridge. Um, again, again, with interaction density, you may remember in the office, pretty big space 
most of it empty. Uh, most of the things you go to TK grab are kind of far away. In this one, we're like, how about we stick it all really close to you? And back of a van fits the like undercover secret agent fantasy a little bit. Um, we've got the different boards you can stick outside the van, the different hats you can wear. And it's all pretty close, all viewable. You don't have any trouble grabbing stuff. Yeah, let's break into that van. Here is how an agent eats an orange. Rind and all, fiber. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. I mean, we should really all be eating rinds. Let's be serious. We don't do it because we're lazy. That's what it is. All right. Max wants to know if there's a boss battle. A boss battle. You know, we never did put a, anything like a boss battle in the first game, did we? Um, I don't know, maybe, maybe the last level has a little boss-like quality to it. But I can say there's, there's some things that I think people would consider boss-like in this game for sure. However, I will also say... Um, unlike maybe a traditional game that just gets harder and harder the more you play, like later levels, maybe you're leveling up, you're allocating some skill points, and now you're able to take on, oh man, this super hard boss. We didn't think that was as um, valuable in a puzzle game. That harder and harder puzzles, you may just approach a level where now you're just making something super frustrating and you're forcing folks to play, die, you know, and repeat. So overall, while things um, build on challenge and build on skills you've developed, from previous levels, things are a bit more even. We really didn't want you to get frustrated while playing it. We want you to feel clever. We want stuff to be just hard enough that you're still getting pulled through, but you're not pulled out of the game and think like, ah, oh, man, that puzzle was dumb or that was too obscure. Um, we really want to keep you in that nice zone where you're never figuring it out first try, stumps you a little bit. Then maybe you, you know, you take a break from the game, take a shower and you're like, ah, I know exactly what I'll try next. Uh, and then you try it and it works. That's that's what we're aiming for with this one. What is this sandwich made out of? Hmm. I'm going with old imitation crab salad. Hmm. Delicious. It lasts. <laughs> I don't think Kat was not a fan of that. Isn't it? Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Well, certainly, if if somehow you were an agent who could just die over and over again, and, and then uh, I believe canonically what is true is the last time you play, or you know, the time where you win, that's what happened. That's all that the Seraxis and your handler remember. So they just think that you are getting better and better. They do see your antics though as well, like. Maybe your propensity to stack. I do like a good stack. Oh, it's got a little. Oh, it's. Oh, it's got a little jiggle to it. Oh, oh, oh no! Oh, the beauty of Unity physics. I'll keep stacking while more questions come in. Oh, that's um a deep philosophical question. Uh, the question was, <laughs> which I keep forgetting to repeat, uh, why does Juniper desire our mask? That beautiful mask you wear is all I desire. Um, well, we don't know much about Juniper yet, do we? Uh, we know that he's famous from um, the, the backstage press. We know that the handler is a big fan of Juniper uh, and that he has been in all sorts of movies and plays. So he's, you know, a, he's a phenom of sorts. So what would he want with us? And how does he even know us? Uh, theoretically, we meet in this level somehow. He hasn't seen us yet. Um, but at some point, we must meet if he's going to be talking about us. And what masks, right? Like, I suppose all these undercover roles are kind of like masks. Maybe he's he's jealous of being an undercover agent. And like as an actor, he wishes that he could be um, in like life or death serious roles maybe that's what he desires but to know the truth you just gotta play it and 
listen to him and talk to him and go through the whole adventure. And only then will it fully make sense. <laughs> Maybe. I, I hope at that point it makes sense. I am. And uh, all right, I'm going to stick my head into the middle of this assortment of hats, and I will emerge with one of them. Which will it be? Which hat is for me? Oh, yeah, I'll shake the beans. <laughs> so, so, someone requested uh, for me to shake my beans, which I will do. I didn't get any. Oh, no. Oh, I need to make a hat stack. That's the problem. All right. Well, first things first, bean shake. Yep. You can't hear it, but they got a nice juicy bean sound. Yep. These are beans with tomato sauce, which is the only way I eat my beans. Ah, yes, that. Well, that was a great question. All right, the question was about um, that the van's a good choice given that I'm technically, me being the agent, uh, I'm technically dead as far as Xeraxis and the world are concerned from the events of the first game. That was totally a spoiler, I apologize. Hopefully you'll still, hopefully you'll still play it. It's really good. Um, but why did we pick a van? Uh, so part of it's from what I was talking about earlier of, I really liked that it was small. I think um, our game does really well in small spaces. We can put a lot of cool interfaces and objects close to you. Um, and I thought it would be, I thought it would be funny to go from like a beautiful office space to back of a van <laughs> that you were uh, highly successful in all of your missions in the first game and you're rewarded with I don't know, like a kind of a used van. It's not even that clean. I I thought it was funny. Hopefully, hopefully you find it kind of funny too. Wonderful. Cool. All right. So, yeah. So I'm um, listening to a question from Kat about uh, the voice acting in the game and how um, the commenter feels like, oh, it's just right. Uh, Jared as the handler is great. Well, what about some of the new voices this time? Um, we we work with a fantastic vocal director, Chris Brown, um, who helps us find just amazing fits for our characters. And we work super closely with her and with them uh, in direction, but so much of it just comes from their own talent and excitement for the roles. Um, as you probably saw, we worked with Will Wheaton on this game. Um, he is the voice of John Juniper, and um, working with him was absolute joy. He really took to the role and had a blast with it. Um, I remember him saying <laughs> it's some of the most fun he's had in a long time. And that's just, that's so important to our team and to myself personally, that people have fun with their work, especially in video games. If we're not having fun making it for you all, do we really expect you're going to have fun when you play it? So I think you're going to hear that come through in all of the vocal performances. Uh, people are over the top when it's appropriate. They're serious. When it's time to be serious, they're, you know, uh, striking and like threatening at just the right moments. Um, but so much of this game experience comes through the characterization um, of the audio, through the voice, whether it's the handler through your ear, or we have a lot of different vocal sources, whether it's a person in the scene with you, um, a radio, a speaker, there's a ton of personality that comes through those. And I think you're really gonna enjoy um, everything that the vocal performances bring to this game. I didn't, all right, so back to the hat stack, important things. So what I gotta do here is if you hover the hat and stick your head in it, you don't end up wearing the hat. That was a massive oversight on my part. So what I gotta do 
get my hats ready, get my beans. This is my uh, hat rack. Oh, I've seen some of you all try, try to put pepper on your beans and you give it a little gentle shake. Foolish. You got to give it a big shake. You got to really, if you give the pepper and the salt a good mighty shake, then you can get it out. I think it's humid in the van and so it doesn't want to come out. In our somewhat used humid van. Yeah, it's like the AC, the AC is broke and you can't turn it off. And it's just, it's just blowing warm, moist air <laughs> all the time. All right, hat stack. Okay, that's one. A two -hoo. Oh, geez, this is going to be a challenge. So my goal here is these are not being hovered. Oh, oh, no. Okay. I think I can do a stack of two, and then we'll see which hat wins the battle for a spot on my head. And I'll wait for a whoa. Well, that's kind of obvious. I get the top one. Got to approach it from the middle. <laughs> ah, still the top wins the day. All right, I think I'm going to get started in a Operation Stage Fright. Let's pop in the tape. Well, we, sp we switched to these little um, uh, cassette-style tapes, mainly just for the fun of it. We thought they were fun and interesting from the like big reels from the first game. You'll see when I pop it in, <laughs> it's supposed to spin. Could have sworn it's fun. <laughs> I think it spins the first time. Brings up this slide. This is where your souvenirs will be. I don't think I saw many streamers spot this little detail. Whoop. Come here. Got to fish it out. In the trash can is a practical guide to mission souvenirs. You've worked hard. Take a little something for yourself. There's a display, which isn't showing them yet because you have to beat the mission. And then little hints, which will just be things like Master of Disguise or Curtain Call. They're like really short text hints. Um, and <laughs> if you pick up this card, it plays the um, stinger for when you find a souvenir. So you know what that sound means. Yeah, secret. We figured we would hide it so that it was indicative of what it's about, right? It's about hidden objects and hard to find stuff. So if you find this, chances are good you're going to be pretty into souvenirs. I'm going to put it back there for safekeeping. That question was about how we go about uh, Easter eggs and little details and some of the stuff I've been pointing out. Um, it is from every possible source, and we're always keeping an ear out. So a ton comes from the team. They have a ton of freedom when they're developing content to just add cool stuff. And if it is within scope and schedule, right, like we'll fit in neat little things. Um, but sometimes the suggestions come from our playtesters or something that we saw folks do. Some are callbacks to the first game that we like to make. Some are from our extended team, like everybody at the studio loves I Expect You to Die and has all sorts of fun ideas for things to add. Um, but you know, honestly, it's that we, we love making this game. Um, we love thinking of fun little things and we know you all will find them and enjoy them too. So it's it really, that's what pushes us forward is knowing that the little touches, the little details we put in will be appreciated. Little details. Looks strikingly like the theater in the intro credits. The Juniper Theater, the Mask of the Red Death. Prince Prospero. Uh, I believe there's a character in Mask Maker, a game that came out recently, and there's a character in that named Prospero too, and people are like, oh, is there a relationship? Uh, Prince Prospero is the main character in the short story, the Edgar Allan Poe short story, The Mask of the Red Death, so that's the link. Um, which I think was turned into a, a Vincent Price movie, I think. And it almost certainly has theater um, interpretations too. So that's what this is. This is Juniper's one-man one play of Mask of the Red Death.
Ah, uh, yes. This was not not the first and won't be the last question about dear old hive minds. Will hive mind return? In what capacity? Uh, for those of you who don't know hive mind, hive mind was featured in the level six of the first game, Seat of Power, uh, in which he is in a Xeraxis building that we're in the deep basement of. Uh, and he is called upon by the guards to try to take care of us since we've we've snuck in there and locked ourselves in. Uh, he is <laughs> a beloved character, not only from you all, but internally we love him too. He is voiced by Julian, who uh, worked on this game as well. He is our fantastic music, sound, all things audio guy, along with Frank Lubsey. Uh, they really, I think, outdid themselves this time. And Julian, <laughs> Julian voiced Hive Mind. So um, I think there's a potential for him to return. I is he in this one? You'll, you'll just have to see. Little, little cliffs, little hangers. My favorite fictional spy, honestly, I think is Ethan Hunt from Mission Impossible. I really dig Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt. The first Mission Impossible, I think is a really, really great movie. And the ones after that, the action just, you, can, you can't top it. It's so ridiculous. So I'm, I'm very into the action spy, um, but I like a lot of the political thriller spy too, like the um, Denzel Washington remake of um, Manchurian Candidate. I thought that was great. Um, I love Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy and the um, espionage in that. So really a big range, honestly. That's true for me in a lot of favorites. I don't pick one. I just pick a bunch. But you know, you can kind of get a sense for, for what I'm into. But it's flavors, right? I have an action flavor, a political flavor, intrigue, depth. Um, and there's pieces of that in the agent from I Expect You to Die. But definitely there's some comedy too. There's some Pink Panther in there. There's some, um, I don't even know Mr. Smart's name from Get Smart, but uh, the Get Smart guy. Uh, there's a lot of that too. I like how in levels in this, you can play it um, Pink Panther style where you're just kind of a, a bumbling idiot. And then as you get better and you're doing speed runs, you can just straight up Jason Bourne it and like know where everyone's coming before they even get there and be like a crazy superhero, super spy. I like that you can play it both ways. All right, I'm gonna start this mission. How am I doing on time, Cat? Oh man, I'm blowing through it. I, <laughs> well, if this was the stream you wanted to watch to see the demo, you're mainly listening to me. Uh, there are lots of other streams and videos. I apologize for that. If you want to like go deep on the demo, this is probably not your stream or video. Uh, if you want to hear about the dev of the game, though, I know <laughs> this disclaimer is coming very late. But uh, there you go. All right, I'm ready for another question, Kat. Have some donuts. Or zonuts. Yeah, it, that's an interesting question. So the question is about uh, what makes VR a good fit for puzzle games? Is it a good fit for puzzle games? Um, and that the sub level felt really claustrophobic. Uh, what was the element tech hat that was a question? Like, um, what, what about the sub? Oh, gotcha, yeah. Yeah, so um, using sub as an example, but honestly, using backstage. Uh, here in Stage Fright, using this as an example. I will illustrate it as such. Um, let's say this is a traditional console game, or even like PC game, let's say Myst. Um, I might have camera control. Granted, I would never be playing like a 
single seated position. But um, given my camera, I would see here, directly straight forward. And I could move my camera around to see other spots. But the field of view would be destroyed, right? Because it needs to be on that 2D plane. You can pick up a lot more in the periphery in VR. And also, it's just kind of natural to get into a space when your head is the camera and look around, see where you are. And because of the look around nature that the head as camera control, it's a great fit for puzzle games because now this is the way that I investigate. It's very natural. Hidden stuff. Oh, there's a locked box behind me. That was from here all the way back over the shoulder. And even just because it was so far from center, it's given me the impression that's probably going to be important. Red buttons, big chunky interface. Then the ability to reach out again with the interaction density. The fact that I can have so many little things all close. If this were a console game, each one of these is what I get a little cursor placed onto this, or I, I do point and click to try to point and click these stuff. But it's not the same as reaching out two hands, pulling sliders with some haptic feedback. So um, puzzle games, I think, can lose some of their reality. Um, everybody's pixel hunted before, right? And you start to feel the gaminess, the game quality. I think VR can keep you immersed longer in that puzzle setting. So maybe you even forget it's a puzzle game. And it's more about this, um, this experience, this challenging experience where, for a moment, you were an undercover uh, spy posing as a stagehand at a theater. You can hear the audience out there. There's a little bit of stage fright. Are you going to blow your cover? Because you, you don't know how to do this job. You don't know what all this interface does. So yeah, it's a, it's a puzzle game. But really, it's using real world stuff, real world challenge and emotion to um, elevate it. Ah, right. So that question is, how did the agent survive the death engine explosion in the first game? Which is more spoilers for the first game. Um, but I'll pause it as another question. At the very end, we hear someone say, be seeing you, agent. And it's after the big explosion. I would say whoever said that, clearly still alive. Us hearing it, clearly still alive. Um, somehow we were able to either be forced back by the blast. That's my theory. We, we were disconnected from and were then um, punched away through the shockwave instead of shattered and broken. But it's still pretty miraculous. Maybe there's, maybe there's something else going on. There could certainly be something else going on. But we do show up back at the office and the handler says, wow, you survived. Well, how about that? That's quite surprising. And if you look out um, side to your right, out the window in the office space, you'll see, you'll see smoke where a building used to be. And that is where the death engine fired, trying to hit um, agency HQ and clearly missed by just like a little bit. And you know, when you got a space laser, that's not bad. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah, um, that was a question of whether I can shoot Juniper or not. Let's shoot Juniper. Challenge accepted. Ready, my dart? <laughs> you don't have to give me too many suggestions for shooting someone. Not in VR. All right, I'm going to have to unlock that. Oh, I'm going to have to do everything. All right. Get everything ready. Yeah. Yeah, and then if I've got enough time left, I'll speed run the whole darn thing. Heck, I'll even get all the Easter eggs. Something like that. Get that little sucker. Pretty cool. Ugh, throw it away. Um, pick this up. Throw that away. Get this. Stick that in. Pull that down. Pull that down. Lock it out. Break that. Oh, you know what? Take this out. Stick that in. Oh, because of course it works. There's Juniper. Come here, buddy. Meet your maker. I got him. <laughs> That's what happens. 
Oh, someone's mad at me. Put on my headphones. Oh, oh no! What? I don't know if any streamers found this yet. Yeah, you can shoot Juniper, and he ducks and he runs away because um, no matter what, somehow you miss him. Hmm, intriguing. Uh, and you die. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you can shoot him, but you won't win. Was that was that from you, Cat? Oh, that's a great question. That was um, what kind of research do you do when you've got a plausible setting? So I wish I could say we did this for every level, and honestly, we would if it wasn't for the pandemic. But for this level. Uh, we went to the Benedum in Pittsburgh, which is just this beautiful old theater. We brought um, just about all of the team that was working on that level. And we got like a VIP tour from, I forget who she was. She was like the, um, you know, really high up there. One of the directors showed us everything. I'm talking every layer of every catwalk. We went to the roof. She showed us how they like prevent fires in theaters. Um, she showed us every angle. We got to go backstage and like look at the panels. So we took something like 500 photos of that place. And uh, if you look at photos of the Benedum and then photos of our level, there's a lot of similarities. We did have to simplify things a tremendous amount. There is definitely not one person who sits at a little desk and does sound, lights, colors for props, pulleys, like They've got dozens and dozens, I don't know, maybe a hundred of these pulleys and on different levels for the fly house, which is what it's called. So we took a lot of those elements and we brought some of that realism in. But then again, with the um, all the interactions close, right? It's all within range. I got buttons, switches, pulleys, um, all close. I've got drawers, buttons over here, some telekinesis stuff far away and then deeper out elements um, we tried to bring a lot of that stage experience nice and close to you the question was what's my favorite part of the first game um, i love the first level the, the car level friendly skies um, because you can show it to just about anybody, even if they have like almost no VR experience, it can like be a tutorial for VR. They're in a car, the challenge is to get out of the airplane that they're in, and they're immediately like, where's the key? And then they find the key up above them and they're like, oh my gosh, they're gonna hide stuff spatially around me. And it, it really starts to get the gears moving for them for what's possible, not just in our game, but in the whole medium. So I love that that level has served as like an ambassador to a lot of VR experiences for, for people who played it. Maybe it was their first experience. So that one's got a special place in my heart, but uh, there's a ton of what I, I love in the first game as well. <laughs> uh, how am I doing on time? Should I uh, beat this and then speed run the demo? Three minutes? That's plenty. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, please drop them in chat. I'm running out of time. There we go. How many ways can you die in the demo? Let's see. One, two, three. I think there's... There's probably three, but I'm not going to tell you where. Here's a hint. Poke. <laughs> you can poke yourself. Okay, I'll bring that out. Okay, there's JJ. That's what we, we call him internally. John Juniper. Little JJ. He's starting his speech. 
I, I can probably answer maybe one or two more questions before I expire. Uh, what happens when the stream ends? Do, does something explode, or can we run a little over? Sweet. Yeah, I want to at least speed run the demo. And you know why? Because I, I like it. Uh, I It brings me great joy to speed run this game. More missions are debuting August 2021. Uh, yes, this demo is only available on Steam and a couple headsets, but the full game is available on basically everything. You can even wish list it straight from the demo. All right, I'm going to replay. Pew. Here we go. Get some bombs. Interesting. Got it. So that was a question about, can you build your expectations based on the quality of the demo? I mean, it is a tutorial and a first level that's still trying to give you an impression of the basics. So the full game really does have a lot more to offer than just the, the demo. I mean, one of the big highlights of this is the intro credits experience. We were really happy to provide that in the demo. But yeah, there's definitely some surprises that I think um, you'll really enjoy. It's not just um, more and more demo experience. Uh, how did we do the intro? Cool. Um, so the intro experience, it starts with the song, right? We don't start with the visuals. Maybe there's a little bit of thinking about both of them at the same time. Um, but then from the song, we start thinking about set pieces, uh, cool stuff to visualize, and we keep the theme in mind the whole time, the theme of facade, uh, the character of John Juniper. We like to tie a lot of the visuals and interactions with the lyrics of the song too. Right here we are starting in a theater as though this is the debut of the second game, right? So there's a lot of metaphor. Um, and you know, we iterate, we we had scenes we cut for sure. We had way more scenes that were all shorter and we lengthened each. He says, from the spotlight, I can see you. Spotlight on him points to us. And we have the spotlight swoop up on us. As he said, this could be you. Turns into missile smoke as he talks about setting the world on fire with a kind of Dr. Strangelove homage, which is also, you know, almost in period as we ride the missile into the burning planet. Then the black smoke covers us. And here we are in Hollywood on a walk of fame. We're in the background hearing him. We're not on the stage. Then the stars turn into death and we're killed by stardom. He takes our mask as he goes on the screen. We're someone watching his movie, The Man in the Golden Mask. And then he shoots out of the screen to hit us. We're the one who bleeds, right? So just each moment has symbolism for the relationship between us and him. The spy and the liar, that's what the game's about is really this um, spy versus spy, you know, uh, mano a mano. That's really something we focus on in the game, and we wanted that reflected in the intro credits. There's Chris Brown. Uh, you may recognize this mask. It was in backstage as the Mask of the Red Death. Film strips and a film strip tongue was something I thought was pretty fun. Unveils and then pulls us in as it chomps. And you've got the like the double scene. Yeah, you can like see the two scenes blend. I'm very proud of that. The door is open with the light coming in, inviting us in, right? Maybe that's his world where we'll die. And yet, screeching around the corner, the agency comes to save us. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of symbolism. But you could interpret things multiple ways, right? It's not a singular interpretation. That's one way to picture it all. Fastest type's better on the demo. I don't know. I might be doing it right now. <laughs> I don't know what my time is. Uh, tutorial, I think I've done in maybe 40 seconds, maybe 30 seconds. I did that pretty fast. And now I'm waiting for the tape. 
that's got to come. But then I, I can speed run backstage and maybe it's going to sound shockingly short, but trust me, you will not be able to do it the first time you play. It takes a lot of optimization of movement, making sure you don't do anything extraneous. Oh my gosh, oh, I failed. Okay. All right, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. So I do this, this. Oh my God, I'm already failing. Pull that down. Pull these at the same time. Big old exaggerated movement. Lock them both. Pull this up. Pull that up. Pull this up. Throw that away. Grab the key. Put the key in. Pull that down. Pull this down. Pull that up. Ooh. Pull that up and lock it. Is that good enough? There. There we go. Lock it. And then spotlight. There we go. But this, <laughs> I do love that about VR. I love the physicality to it. Um, also, as a reminder, that was not the first mission. This was the first part of the first mission. Um, and you know, it involves following stage instructions to try to stay in character, but things are probably not going to go as planned. We certainly have some things we need to deal with in the world, and um, probably some people who won't take kindly to that. So that's what you have to look forward to in the full game. Whew, yeah, that was gave me a little workout. You got to move. If you want to get those speedruns, we did, I will say, I think we made the speedruns way harder this time. My feeling, and Francisco, our design director, we both agreed that um, if you're looking to do speedruns, you want a challenge, right? If you, you know, just want to play the game, enjoy the story, right? Then the, the puzzles, again, they're going to require cleverness, but they're not going to, uh, they're not going to be brutally hard. But some of the speedruns are going to be really tough. And we hope that you enjoy that challenge of like optimization of movement, memorizing best, fastest ways. There's alternate solves. Which alternate solve is the most efficient? Is the fast? Can you skip any steps? Um, but I can guarantee you this. You won't need to use any like bugs or exploits to get any of the speedrun times. It's all real actions in the levels to do them. Speed runs. Yes. Oh, sweet. Adam Kuda. Hey. Thank you so much for leading our awesome community and being such a great support for all of them. Yeah, is there anything more, Kat, or should I start to wrap up? All right. Yes, yes. And so there's a whole lot of Will Wheaton. There's a whole lot of Juniper in this game, as you could probably guess. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you all for all of your awesome questions. It was really fun to spend this time with you and to share some of this game that I love. And the team is so proud of what we've made. We think you're going to really have a great time playing it. We can't wait to hear what you all think. Can't wait to hear ideas you have for future games. Um, and you don't have to wait long. Uh, August, it'll be out on, if you've got a VR headset, I bet it runs on it. Uh, and can't wait to see y'all stream. I hope to see your videos. I hope to see your story theories uh, and everything. You better believe it. We watch everything. We read all the comments. We love it. We make these games for you. And it brings us great joy to see you enjoy them. All right, thanks, everybody. Uh, I will hopefully see you all again and maybe get to stream again. Yes, join us on Discord. We have an awesome Discord community, and there's special events that happen only there, um, little puzzles, uh, little fun stuff. Adam does a great job of just making that a really warm, and welcoming, and super fun community. All right, I'm going to press the end stream button, and we'll, we'll call it a wrap. Bye, everybody.